Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And we are back in the Pacific for the first of a double bill today. To tell us about the campaign for this atoll is Ryan from Patriot Preservation. Links to his book are in the description below. And I'm holding up a copy because I have my own copy. And as we will find out in the show, it's about one of those campaigns that just doesn't seem to get talked about because it kind of overshadowed by not necessarily bigger, but more, more, more um, well-known events before and after. But if you're new to World War II TV, because I don't always do shows on the weekends, welcome aboard. All the information you need is always in the description below. You'll find out about our merchandise, links to our other channel, World War I TV, and you can consider becoming a patron or a channel member. But without further ado, I'll bring Ryan in. Good afternoon, sir. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. It's a lovely day here in Orlando, Florida. Super. So when people are coming, you have been on before, you did one of the photographic studies with me a couple of years ago, but um, people come on this channel from different walks of life who convey military history, academia, some are you know, authors of your prolific numbers of books. You kind of come at this from a sort of a, a, a collecting point of view, the artifacts. So explain a little bit about, um, about your background and how this led to writing the book. So I've been collecting World War II history for almost 20 years now. Um, started when I was a kid. Uh, it, you know, it started with the antique show, going to this little antique show where things were quite in abundance at the time. You won't see it as much anymore. But uh, I remember seeing a photograph album and a Purple Heart sitting in a display case. And I begged my parents. I said, it's $20. Can we get it, please? And from that day on, I was hooked. And from that point on, I knew my life was never going to be the same. Uh, to me, having the history in your hands brings you closer to that period in time besides the oral testimony that you can possibly get. It's like stepping into a time machine. So that's the way I like to learn history is through those, these physical objects. And today, um, currently have a repository of about 10,000 artifacts under Patriot Preservation, which uh, continues to teach history. Absolutely. Uh, not so much these days for twenty dollars, though. That's the thing. Is it? No. Back when I was, collecting, <laughs> it was pocket money prices when I was um, when I was collecting stuff, and now it's um, few telephone number prices. But that that's the the passing of time, I guess. But you've come on with a PowerPoint, which you will guide me through. I'll move things on, folks. Kind of do questions as we go along, if you, if there are any. But I think for most of you watching, you're not going to know a huge amount about this, and we'll just sit and learn from Ryan. But of course, we welcome your feedback. We welcome your comments. It's help. It's good for the algorithm. So. So over to you, Ryan. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of um, the Any We Talk campaign. So um, as Paul was saying, this is not really one of those campaigns that you really look at and you say, ooh, I know at least a little bit about this. Uh, not, not too many people I've talked to that specialize in the Pacific War say, ooh, I can follow the Any We Talk action from day to day. It's just not something that you're going to run into a whole lot. And uh, that was one of the challenges when I was writing this book, Sandspit Assault, is that when I was researching it, there was actually a lot of information that at times was conflicting. Uh, people had different viewpoints about what really happened. Uh, the oral testimony had much of the same. Um, but I was also shocked to discover that in the 80 years, almost 80 years since the Battle of Wita, no one has ever compiled a full testimony of this campaign before. Um, and that's why I originally set on to do that. This is this was my COVID child, uh, right at the beginning of COVID. I that we had real people, Americans and Japanese, fight and die for this place. And in in that respect, we need to save this this period in history before it just becomes completely forgotten forever. And it also remains completely relevant in the modern day and age, which we get to a little bit later. So if we can kind of actually just go back a little bit more to what kind of war was this? Um, we talk about the Pacific. So let's just talk about the anatomy here. We have uh, this side of World War II. On the other side of the globe, uh, the Pacific Ocean is the largest ocean on planet Earth. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of islands scattered across the Pacific. Uh, and the United States is going to go across the entirety of this ocean all the way to Japan. It's going to be one of the greatest logistical challenges. In hang on a second, history. Ryan. People are saying yes. the audio is breaking up. Is it just folks? Is it my microphone and Ryan's or both microphones? I'll just, there seems to be not, not everything's clear from here, but let's just check that there's something going. 
Uh, Robert says it's better now. Is it is it just me or is it Ryan as well? Someone answer in the sidebar. Am I sounding okay? We love I can do a simple test. Yeah. How do I sound, well, folks? Everyone, well, everyone's saying it's okay now. So uh, All right. it is better. Okay, well, we'll carry on then. All right. Well, um, just to kind of catch up from that. So um, when we're looking at the Pacific War, we are looking at one of the greatest logistical challenges to face any nation in history. I mean, we're talking uh, getting uh, soldiers, sailors, Marines all the way from uh, San Francisco. We're talking about getting the Japanese Imperial Army and Navy all the way from Tokyo all the way out to the Pacific as well. So you're you're seeing two different nations come together and and find out on their own about how to do this. And um, each one have their own way. So the United States is going to assault more than 116 islands during the Pacific War. Uh, the face of this campaign is not going to resemble Europe at all. Uh, we have entire German armies collapsing in France. Um, there is a great deal of surrender. Um, in, the, in the Pacific, you are going to see practically none of this. Uh, you are going to see a, a soldier that is following an ideology that is, it's, it's a very old ideology back to a feudal time in Japanese history. Uh, more specifically, where surrender is considered a dishonor. You're waking up again, Ryan. That looks going on. Um, do you want to try dropping out coming in again? That often yeah, let's, uh, do you want me to uh, yeah. leave the studio and come back in? Yep, yeah, I'll hold the thought and I'll uh, bring you back in. It is, it's fine for me, but uh, we'll try again. Just, just try dropping out. You got it. That's weird, folks. Uh, it's perfectly, I, I'm hearing everything perfectly. And normally, if there's an issue, I can hear it. So, um, yeah, well, well, Ryan will come in again and we'll, hopefully it'll be sorted out. Um, me as well now, apparently. That's really weird. That's really weird. Uh, Okay. All right. Apparently it's me as well. I have no idea what's going on. Let me um, look at the settings. Sorry about this, folks. Uh, there's no apparent reason for it at my end. Uh, right. Uh, let's try again, Ryan. Let's see. All right. How do we how do we sound on this end? Uh, there's, they're saying my audio is better again, but I'm not sure about yours. I'm sounding good. Someone just someone just say how Ryan say something again. Hello. Okay. This is weird. Um okay, well try again, Ryan. If 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 we can't cure this, both good now, Willie says. Thank you, Willie. Okay, can we carry on then? All right, all right, sounds good. All right, so hopefully the uh the internet will cooperate with us. So <laughs> just, just moving on. Um, so the, the face of this war is going to be completely different. You're going to have a, uh, a soldier that is following this feudal ideology where um, surrender is considered a dishonor uh, on the battlefield and suicide is preferred. Um, there is also a tremendously cruel treatment of prisoners. Uh, the Japanese soldier is going to view prisoners as unmanly uh, and treat them horribly, as we see during the Bataan Death March and the surrender of Corregidor. Um, uh, the Marines on Wake Island, uh, you're, you're going to see this as a consistent pattern. So the Japanese soldier is a very tough enemy to fight. Um, they typically fight to the last man. And, and this is going to be something you're going to see out for the entire Pacific campaign. And it, it's going to get bad enough where the United States actually has to drop an atomic weapon as a choice to end the thing. I mean, just thinking about how difficult that kind of fighting is to result in such a decision uh, gives you a good idea about how ferocious this war was. And uh, just talking with the veterans over the years um, and getting to know these people personally and listen to these personal accounts, I can definitely see why uh, everybody was relieved that they would not be invading Japan in 1945 mm -hmm. to 1946. So if we uh, go to the next slide, we're going to uh, we're gonna go to where may we talk is and just to jump so, in and add a comment ryan you made that point about the japanese defending pretty much every every location to the same level of, of fanaticism because we talk often about whether or not some of the island hopping campaign was necessary people talk about was taro were necessary was pelilu necessary and that those are interesting discussions but regardless of whether or not the island was 
may be necessary in the grand scheme of things. The Japanese pretty much always fought for them that same way. So if you're fighting on them, your last concern is whether or not this is really an essential part of the grand strategy. All you're caring about is the fact that the Japanese ahead of you are, are, make, are, are making you pay for every, every meter in blood. Exactly. And, you know, I think that's where a lot of the decisions um, about surrounding the larger naval bases at, at Truk and Rabal are going to come from, because they're, they were so fortified at the time that uh, simply invading places like that would have just been absolutely fruitless. So um, we invaded where we felt that we had to invade with the fewest casualties possible. Um, this is why I also think General Douglas MacArthur uh, followed the concept of hit them where they ain't when he was going through the South Pacific to the Philippines, right? Whereas the Navy and Marine Corps went through the Central Pacific in more direct to Japan. And this is this is kind of where, why, where, and why we end up at enemy talk in the first place. Um, that shorter route all the way to the Japanese home islands. Um, now, in the grand scheme of things, where the heck are we? Where is Enoe talk? Has anyone heard of Enoe talk? Um, most likely not. Uh, this place, means in their language, the native language, uh, the land between West and East. And when you're talking about this translation, it is very true. Uh, you are talking about 5,000 miles to San Francisco, the West Coast of the United States, and 2,200 miles to Tokyo. This is really uh, a name that has earned itself, right? Um, it remained isolated for so long from the outside world. It remained completely unchanged. The people that had settled this atoll had drifted hundreds of thousands of miles. These were Austronesian settlers who came in on canoes and they jumped from island to island to island over the millennia. Uh, we know that people have settled this atoll since about 1000 BC. And it wasn't until about halfway through the 1500s that Europeans started to realize that there was actually a, a place called Anahuitoc and that this place even existed. And uh, a Spanish explorer actually came ashore and called it the gardens in Spanish. Uh, and that was the last time that Europeans are going to look at it until the 1700s, until the British came by and used it as part of the, uh, the, uh, the trading, the East India Trading Company. And they renamed the whole atoll called Brown's Range. And it was, it remained this way to where the Japanese actually called it Brown Atoll. And they kept that name ever since. Uh, Germany eventually gained control of NOE talk. And after the First World War, uh, part of what Japan was granted for siding with the Allies in World War I was this atoll. So they were granted the Marshall Islands from Germany. And on the grand scheme of things, it seemed like a very little loss. But uh, when Japan gained control of the Marshall Islands, they started sending... Uh, their military out there pretty quickly. Um, Saipan, they've owned since 1920. They started really reinforcing the Pacific from the 20s into the 30s. Um, but any we talk, although they owned it on paper, they did very little to administer the atoll. So um, it really wouldn't be until about 1942 that any we talk's history would really be changed. After November of 1942, uh, and we talk would never be the same. And it still hasn't even today. Brilliant. So if we can go to the next slide, take a look. This is a map to give you an idea of how isolated this place is. Um, if you look at the Marshall Islands, chain, the Gilbert Islands, the Carolines, Marianas, it's situated right in the middle. And if you see on the map here, you see Truk. This is where the Japanese main naval base is. And most of the reinforcement that had actually gone to Guadalcanal were actually passing through Truk. That was, I've always seen Truk as the heart of the empire up until 1942, 1943, because all these reinforcements are going down there. They had to stop at Truk to either resupply or to have their troops wait there. So if NAW talk was seized, that was an extra projection of air power that could cut off Truk overall and be a perfect staging ground for the next set of assaults into the Marianas Islands on Saipan, Guam, and Tinian. So uh, to me, this is what makes NOE talk so important in terms of um, in geopolitical and military significance. So it's very easy to see this. 
Uh, what has happened in the Pacific up through 1942 and 1943? Quite a bit. Uh, Japan bombs Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, and gets us into the war. Uh, the United States is not really sure on how it's going to conduct the war amphibiously. Uh, we are going to have to go through a lot of learning. And the first place we learned on how to do amphibious warfare was on Guadalcanal. On August 7th, 1942, the U.S. Marines landed on Guadalcanal and Tulagi and Kabutu Tanabogo and fought that out for six to seven months of nonstop combat. Uh, the first inkling that the Pacific War was going to be difficult was on August 21st, 1942, when the Japanese tried to cross at Alligator Creek. Uh, you had 777 men of the Ichiki force destroyed out of 900 Japanese. Most of the Marines began to say to themselves, is this how every battle is going to be? Are they going to fight to complete annihilation all the way to Japan? And, uh, when reports about the Guadalcanal campaign were reaching the United States, people were saying to themselves, well, uh, it doesn't look like this was this is going to be easy as people had made it out to be. And uh, this victory at Guadalcanal was going to lay out the entire uh, the entire picture for the whole Pacific War. And the, the same is going to remain for NOE talk. It's going to be a fight to the death no matter how, no matter what we did. And for the remainder of 1943, it's going to be little small steps throughout the Pacific. We are going to move up the Solomon Islands towards New Georgia. We're going to start to invade little islands around there. We're going to even go as far north as the Aleutian Islands off Alaska. We are going to retake Atu and Kiska as a matter of pride. Uh, these are very small baby steps. We're not really going to get into a large scale assault directly to Japan until late 1943. And it's as much about practicing the art as it is actually reclaiming the islands. I mean, it's both, isn't it? It's it's that the realization that the swiftness with, with the Japanese conquered, the allies will have to vet, get very, very good at combined arms and amphibious operations. So, and the best way to do that is keep doing them um, until you get to, to be able to master them. Exactly. It's going to be a a tested and repeated process all the way through. We're, we made a lot of mistakes up until then. Um, Guadalcanal was a good example. Atu was another good example. Logistics are going to have to be learned. And, you know, these are hard lessons that we're going to have to pay for early on. And uh, this is going to be especially apparent as we go into the Gilbert Islands campaign uh, at the Great Battle of Tarawa, which we will will start talking about now, which is really gonna that that's really gonna define how we're going to do these heavier and bigger battles later on. Uh, if you can remember the map, the Gilbert Islands hold the key to the rest of the Japanese Empire throughout the Central Pacific. Uh, if we can take Tarawa with its important airfield, and that's what this whole campaign is going to be about. It's going to be about airfields. It's going to be about capturing these airfields so we can project air power throughout the rest of these islands and move on to the next. This concept is going to be known as island hopping. And if we island hop successfully and learn little things along the way, we're going to get better and better. And Tarawa is going to be this really big debut. Hey, the Japanese are defending on the beach. Can we land successfully on a defended beachhead like the rest of these islands throughout the Pacific all the way to Japan are going to be and be able to pull this off. Um, so can we do it? And on November 20th, 1943, we find out the hard way. Uh, the tides were miscalculated. And at that point, a lot of the landing craft, these, these LCVP landing craft that drop the ramps, they get stuck on the reefs. The alligator the alligator landing craft go all the way to Asio successfully, but these landing craft that have these ramps on them, they get stuck out of the reef and all these Marines start pouring out under heavy Japanese fire. And the casualties are absolutely appalling. And the casualties for the Tarawa assault really make people scratch their heads and say, well, I don't really know if we can do this. We lost over a thousand Marines in this assault. Uh, the entire Japanese force of 4,600 men 
were lost in this assault for the exception of 17 survivors. I call them survivors because they did not give up willingly. They had to be taken alive. Um, Macon Atoll was far more successful. Uh, the U.S. Army is going to take this one. And we'll get more towards the inter-service rivalry between the U.S. Army and the U U.S. Marine Corps, as this was a technically a joint operation for the Gilberts. But we'll get more into that um, as we talk about NOE talk. But the people in the United States were saying to themselves, I don't know if we can really do this. And people in the U.S. Navy were saying to themselves as well, uh, well, we have a lot of coral atolls to go. So Kwajalein is next. Is Kwajalein going to be just as bad as Tarawa was? And when Kwajalein was invaded on February 1st, 1944, we took the lessons applied at Tarawa. We had a heavier bombardment. We made sure to land quicker. We did not give the Japanese time to react while landing on Kwajalein. And the results bore a lot of fruit. It was a it was a great thing. Not even 60 seconds after the bombardment on Kwajalein, uh, the U.S. Marine Corps and the U.S. Army was ashore. They hit the islands of Roy Namur and Kwajalein Island, and the casualties were extremely light. And this was extremely good news. This was the news that the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps and U.S. Army wanted to see. And it gave a lot it gave a lot more confidence that, hey, we can probably conquer a lot of the rest of these atolls going forward. And originally, NOE talk had a very far out planned invasion date. But with this newfound success on Kwajalein, Admiral Harry Hill and Admiral Chester Nimitz, they were looking at the success in Kwajalein. They were saying, let's do this. Let's start pushing this in the right direction. Let's keep going. The Japanese did not defend on the beach as they did at Tarawa. Let's let's continue in the right direction. And that's what they did. So they started planning immediately. If you want to look, this is what the fighting in the Central Pacific was doing. Uh, these are the casualties on Red Beach 1 on the left at Tarawa. You see one of the sunken tanks. It's actually still there today. And on the right, you can see clearly there is a heavier bombardment administered to Kwajalein. This is Kwajalein here on the right. This is what you would have seen if you landed on February 5th, 1944, to inspect the battlefield. And uh, the, the sheer volume of the bombardment st stunned a lot of the Japanese on this island, and they did not have really a chance to react. Um, so this seemed to be the key to the success going forward through the coral atolls. Um, plus, the Japanese did not have the adequate equipment or the time to really successfully build up defenses such as what Tarawa possessed in the first place. Um, so with this newfound success, we began to look in the right direction, but we also had to consider how are we going to pull an atoll assault nearby with the few resources that we have on hand? We have to do this quickly, but how are we going to do it? So it's actually going to come from the available forces in the area. And who's that going to be? Well, there are actually several units on standby, and one of them are the 22nd Marine Regiment. Um, they were formed in Linda Vista, San Diego. They were considered the first regimental combat team formed by the, by the United States in World War II. And a, a lot of these guys, by and large, had formed right after Pearl, they had joined right after Pearl Harbor. And I actually read through a couple of the testimonies from some of these Marines who served with the 22nd Regiment that they also had a large contingent of men who had been, they had been booked in the brig for all sorts of offenses. And they were let out of the brig and they were given a chance to go with this regiment because they were about to deploy overseas soon. So they were given that mm -hmm. chance and formed, helped form the 22nd Marines. So this was a really, really tough outfit from the get-go, as you can imagine. Um, with the Japanese threat, to the South Pacific and Australia and American, uh, the American fortress on Samoa, the 22nd Marine Regiment was sent out pretty quickly in 1942, and they were sent down to Samoa to guard it. Uh, it was unknown if the Japanese were going to invade at that time, so they were sent down there as a precautionary. They would help train the native population as well and get them ready for an invasion if it ever came to it. Uh, when the 22nd Marine Regiment was there, they endured an epidemic of disease, like the worst you can imagine. Uh, they had a problem with something called filariasis. 
And this was brought on by a mosquito that would bite you. And this virus would go through your body and swell your appendages. And the Marines actually had a major problem with this. It was something to, it was something to a quarter to half of the 22nd Marine Regiment was infected with some sort of tropical disease. It was a mm. real problem. And um, some of these men would actually not even see symptoms until after the Anahuitoc campaign. Some actually had to go home from Samoa because they were down with this debilitating disease. Uh, one Marine that I read about, his mother actually pleaded with the Marine Corps. She wrote directly to General Vandegrift and said, don't send my son out. He's been down with filariasis multiple times. He's been down with malaria. And um, they really had a problem on their hands and it really nipped away at the efficiency of this, of this uh, regimental combat team. So they endured this when they were down there in Samoa. Uh, Wallace Island was just as bad. They were training down there too, uh, getting ready for deployment to some distant land out in the Pacific. They weren't sure where they would ever go. They were just there on standby. But um, they would not leave Samoa and Wallace Island until 1943. So they were there for quite a long time. Uh, and it really, it really took a toll on the psychological condition of the 22nd Marine Regiment, they were happy to get out of there. And when they started training in Maui, uh, they weren't really prepared to go into coral atolls. Uh, there was actually a report that was written and somebody said the following, in retrospect, we were sent to attack a coral atoll. We rehearsed on the large island of Maui on terrain approaches unlike those of the target. Um, <laughs> there was no appreciable move inland, um, no work with gunfire, air or artillery fire to accustom them in actual combat conditions. So by the time they actually even get to Enuitoc, none of them had ever worked together before. There was none of this cohesion that they needed for a sophisticated amphibious operation. So the training on Maui did not do anything for them to prepare them for the Enuitoc assault. However, the 22nd Marines were very well trained in uh, in small unit action, which would really play a significant role later. So the 22nd Marines are going to begin the task of assaulting this later on. They're sitting on Kwajalein watching the battle happen. So they're going to be one part of the equation. And the other part of the equation is going to be the U.S. Army. Um, this gentleman over here on the right is Ralph Smith. Uh, he was known as a gentleman and a gentleman. Uh, he was very well respected in the ranks, uh, very soft-spoken. People that knew him and met him uh, felt he was friendly, offered his hand, uh, you know, shaking it, shaking hand with the privates and, and just really getting to know the men. Uh, people really respected him for that. Uh, he won the Silver Star in World War I. And uh, people felt he was a very capable commander. Uh, George C. Marshall also picked him out for intelligence work and felt him he was a very capable person. So it's no surprise to me that he was given command of the 27th Infantry Division overall. Uh, the division uh, saw combat in World War I. And during the 1930s, it was mobilized as a New York National Guard unit. And they were said to defend key infrastructure and do divisional maneuvers as what you would see in Europe. They were slated to go over to France if necessary. So they started training in all these open battlefield conditions that you would see over in Europe, nothing like the Pacific. So when December 7th, 1941 comes around, the 27th Infantry Division is given the call. Uh, they had been at Fort McClellan for some time. They still had their World War I gear. They still had the Doughboy helmets. They still had uh, the wrapped leggings. And they were told to head west. They were not going to Europe. And they started to get a clue of where exactly they were going when the warm air of California met them. And they finally arrived at Fort Ord to begin training to go to the Pacific. Um, definitely a wake up call for them. And eventually part of the division went to capture Macon Atoll during the Gilbert Islands campaign. Uh, they were they were a very green outfit. So when they landed on Macon Atoll, some of them were on the beach reading magazines, just relaxing. Uh, it took roughly about three days to capture Butari Tari Island on Macon. 
And when Holland M. Smith visited Macon Atoll to see how the battle was going, he had just came back from the Battle of Tarawa and watched the slaughter there. So when he got to Macon Atoll and saw that um, the U.S. Army was held up by one machine gun, he flew in a rage and said, it's quieter than a Sunday in Wall Street. Get moving. And so I think this is where the rift between the services really begins between mm. the Smiths. And uh, I'm sure Pacific War historians know a lot about this rift between the United States Army and the United States Marine Corps. This goes back to the days of Guadalcanal. And as the two services work together and we talk, it's going to be no different. So we're going to see this happen there as well. But um, the U.S. Army successfully takes Macon Atoll. And they all successfully take Majora Atoll with no resistance the same day as their army counterparts are splashing ashore at Kwajalein on February 1st, 1944. Um, I, I think in some respects, people might look at the Pacific campaign and say, well, you know, it was, a, it was a U.S. Marine Corps affair. Well, the United States Army had a very heavy role to play in the Pacific War. Uh, they were committing paratroopers to jump on Corregidor in 1944. They were taking the Aleutian Islands. They were taking New Guinea. Uh, they had an active role in the Guadalcanal campaign. The United States Army was very, very involved in the Pacific. And I think in some respects it is underplayed at times. But this is the division that is going to join the United States Marines in conquering Anahuitoc. But uh, the, the people that are facing the United States are going to be in a similar scenario. Let's look at the Japanese. So we actually captured quite a bit of material during the NOE talk campaign. So we know uh, a couple things about them. And we're also going to take a look at some primary source material from the NOE talk campaign. This is going to help us out. This is actually what was known as a Guntai Techo. This is a personal Japanese logbook captured during the Battle of NOE talk. And it's things like this that are going to tell intelligence teams and historians later on about what kind of enemy that the United States had faced or were going to face on nearby islands or atolls. Uh, this one belonged to a member of the 1st Amphibious Brigade's 1st Battalion. So that's how we know it was captured on Enewee Talk Island. But it's little things like this that are going to make a difference in saving lives and other battles. But uh, the 1st Amphibious Brigade is not going to be this really heavily trained Japanese force, not anything you saw on Guadalcanal or Tarawa. Uh, these guys were formed on November 16th, 1943. They were a conglomerate of men that had been guarding a railroad during most of the Second Sino-Japanese War. Uh, they had very little experience. They had been fighting very little against the Chinese. And once they had formed... They got the orders to move out and head to Japan through Korea. And from the records that we know, most of these Japanese soldiers had been in the service a very, very short time. Some of them show 1942. Uh, some of them had just signed up in 1943 or were conscripted. Uh, these amphibious brigades, uh, I've heard this question before asked to me, you know, what's the difference between a amphibious brigade of the Japanese Imperial Army and the Japanese Navy Special Landing uh, Naval Landing Forces? Um, these as a unit are more highly trained. Um, they are designed to be rushed between atolls or islands quickly in the event of an American assault, whereas Special Naval Landing Forces are meant to be landed from a ship and hold certain areas like a port. Um, I'm sure, I, I believe you had Mr. Austin Adachi on one of yep. your shows talk about Riku Sentai, and he could probably provide a little bit more clarification on that. But um, these amphibious brigades were a response to the ever-changing situation in the Pacific War. Um, it, was, it was a very hastily formed idea. It was the first amphibious brigade that is going to be sent out to Anahuitoc and given this responsibility of defending the Marshall Islands in their sector. Um, originally, they were not supposed to be on Enemy Talk alone. They were supposed to be divided across multiple atolls, but they got caught at the wrong place at the wrong time. So the person that is responsible for commanding the 1st Amphibious Brigade is General Yoshimi Natsida. And he played a very little role 
during his time in the Japanese Imperial Army. He commanded the 41st Japanese uh, Imperial uh, Infantry Regiment. Um, he did not really have a, a grand debut into the Pacific besides giving command of this amphibious brigade. When he shipped out with the 1st, 3rd, 1st and 3rd Battalion, as well as the HQ Battalion, uh, he was most likely briefed on the recent loss of Tarawa in November of 1943, as they were sent out there. And overall, the picture did not look good for where they were going. Uh, they were told that the Americans had quickly conquered Tarawa and that they were going to be given very little supplies. They were given roughly about 3,000 men, which they were not going to be given the full allotment of these 3,000 men. They were, they were not going to have the full strength when they were going to be dropped off at NOE talk originally. Um, so I'm sure that in retrospect, General Nishida had no uh, disillusion that he was probably going to die here at, at NOE talk. So he, uh, he decided that he was going to leave it to his commanders to come up with their own defense. And they finally arrive at NOE talk on January 4th, 1944. And that's what they decide to do. He said to his commanders, okay, we are not likely going to survive an American assault if they come, if they come, which is a high probability. So you have to go on your own accord and defend the way you see fit. And we will come to that a little bit later. So if we can go to the next one. Um, Anna talk gets a very, very quick introduction to the war, not long after the 1st Amphibious Brigade arrives to Anawitak. Uh, the garrison is told that once bombings began, they can expect an invasion within the next couple of days. And the Anawitak assault was designed to coincide with a very important operation, Operation Hailstone, which the U.S. Navy was going to eliminate the Japanese naval base at Truk on February 17, 1944. So uh, the idea was to simultaneously bomb, shell, strafe this island into submission before an assault would begin. And uh, originally, an idea for the assault in Enoita came on February 12th, and they wanted it to move up to coincide with this Operation Hailstone uh, to make sure they coincided perfectly. Just a quick uh, question from Gary. Gary is saying, so before January 1944, it was basically undefended or very lightly defended? Very lightly defended. So uh, the units that you saw on NOE talk before the arrival of the 1st Amphibious Brigade were the 4th Construction Battalion. Right. And you also had members of the Japanese 61st Naval Guard Force who defended primarily on Engevi Island. That was where about 99% of their personnel were. Uh, they were designed to take care of that Japanese airfield that you see right there. This is actually in Gebi being bombed into submission. They only had a few aircraft sitting there, but uh, this is the first time that Enoetak really receives a fighting garrison as a whole. Uh, this whole garrison is a big conglomerate of people. You have, you also have pilots that were shot down and rescued. You have, uh, you have sailors from sunken ships waiting to go home and being rotated back to Japan. Uh, you have also Japanese civilians from the Sankyu Transportation Company sitting there. You have people that are not that are not looking forward to staying here at all, and they're looking to go home. But the American bombing changes all of that. Um, once, they, once the U.S. starts bombing and Gebi and the Enoe Take Toll, they were there to stay. Um, they had six weeks to prepare for this assault. And the Japanese remained in holes in the ground for the rest of the campaign. Once the bombings began, they did not get out. They stayed in these holes. And it drove them absolutely crazy. Um, as I mentioned, the Japanese garrison commanders were given the choice. They said, defend on your own accord. You have Engebi Island to the north. You have Enuitak Island to the south. And you have Perry Island to the south as well. So every one of these islands were defended in a very special way. Colonel Yano, Toshio Yano, defended Engebi Island to the north, which would be assaulted uh, by the Marines first. So he made a summation of how the invasion would likely happen. 
said the enemy will bomb this island either with carrier land-based planes and will bombard us from all sides with battleships and heavy cruisers. Directly following these bombardments, an amphibious force landing will be carried out. Uh, initially, they started digging as fast as they could. From the moment they got there, they started digging bunkers and trenches and anything to start building defenses. They had no rest whatsoever. And uh, they started digging uh, all these trench lines and bunkers along the ocean side. And then the new trenches that the Americans found on the lagoon side show that the Japanese were likely told about what happened at Kwajalein and Tarawa, that they had learned that the Americans were probably going to come from the lagoon side this time, not the ocean. Right. Um, but the Japanese did not fare well in their very short time on Anawitake Atoll. But um, by and large, they lived in holes in the ground. It was probably a very miserable existence for them. Um, General Nishida told his men, uh, try to scatter the enemy at the water's edge as best as you can, and then come out in night attacks. And uh, if you find yourself in the position of being captured, you are required to kill yourself. Uh, typical standard Japanese defensive mm -hmm. doctrine to the T. To the so that in, in that way, it's not going to make the enemy talk assault easy at all. So the enemy talk expeditionary group is going to be formed. This is going to be a force that is going to be assembled in 12 days. That is fast. So once the United States had gathered the 22nd and 106, uh, 22nd Marines and the 106th infantry regiment of the 27th infantry division, um, they also gathered some uh, amphibious reconnaissance companies, uh, the second uh, separate tank battalion to take part in the assault as well. They gathered as many forces from the area around Kwajalein as they could. A um, couple other divisions were considered for the assault, uh, such as the 2nd Marine Division and 3rd Marine Division uh, for the assault on Enoetok, but they were too far away. Uh, the 2nd Marine Division had to rebuild its strength after Tarawa, and the 3rd Marine Division was still busy with Bougainville. So anything in the area was used. And they grabbed them all and said, okay, we're going to take this haphazard force and we're going to assault this quickly. And uh, after 12 days, they moved out and they, they were very scanty on the details. The Americans did not know a whole lot about what they were about to face. They figured by intelligence uh, that about only 700 Japanese were going to face the Americans on all three islands in the talk Atoll. They said, oh, this is going to be a cinch. We're going to be able to conquer this. No problem. And uh, they started actually printing after the battle. These are known as uh, after action reports. So when you read these primary sources, such as after action reports, this one in particular actually mentions that intelligence data on Enoetok Atoll was somewhat vague. Until early January, the force reported that I had totaled approximately 700, mostly concentrated on Angebi Island to the north. However, in late January, Jekpoa uh, reported that a mobile unit of 4,000 army troops shipborne was somewhere in the marshals east of Truk. So as the United States conquered Kwajalein, all these reports started to come in really fast from these prisoners saying, yeah, um, Right over there, there's probably about three to 4,000 other guys that are sitting probably on NOE talk. And this prompted a very, a very hasty response from the United States saying, hey, we got to assault this place as quick as possible. And that's what we did. So uh, the NOE talk expeditionary group decided that they were going to assault first and Gebi to the north after surrounding key islands on each side of it and shell it into the night. Uh, that was the first phase of the assault. The second phase of the assault, the United States Army's 106th Infantry Regiment under the 27th Division would assault Enoetok Island. That was next. And once Enoetok Island was secured, finally, Perry Island, which held General Yushimi Nishida's HQ, would be assaulted last with the United States Marines with all three battalions. So this was going to have to be a fast and furious assault to get it over with. The U.S. Navy just wanted to conquer it and get out, get out of this atoll. Um, the reward was going to be worth it. The lagoon was actually one of the largest in the world next to Kwajalein. So the benefits were going to be extraordinary if they could get it done, which they well, I think, knew I they think the word is going to be operational tempo. It's going to be following in our second show later with Matthew talking about um, the first armored in Salerno. It's the 
in, in a situation where you're not quite certain about the enemy's strength is maintaining speed. Just get, get it all done quickly. And theoretically that, that, that will, will count for a lot. Absolutely. And that, that was the, that was the key that they kept in their, in their heads. They said, well, um, if there are more than 700 Japanese, we really have to improvise at this point. Um, that was what really surprised me while researching all of this is just how hasty this operation was. It was, it reminded me of when you do a science project in fifth grade and you scrounge around the night before. That's, that's the way yeah. I really describe yeah. it. Um, <laughs> just looking at all the. I have no after frame after of reference for leaving homework and projects the night before. So I have no idea what you're talking about, Ryan. That's <laughs> never, that's not part of my youth at all. <laughs> it's like, no, the, the U S Navy and Marine Corps and the army would never do this, but you know, it, it's, this was something that they, they wanted to take and they knew they needed to take to, uh, to cut off truck for good. And uh, they knew if enemy talk was secured, uh, truck was going to have a very difficult time for the rest of the war. There was no need to invade it. Just take enemy talk and it's uh, it's flank was going to be secured. And uh, the next phase of the war could begin in the Marianas. Um, so on uh, February 16th, 1944, uh, the expedition, the enemy we talk expeditionary group entered the lagoon and the Japanese offered no return fire as they had done at Tarawa. And uh, we know that this infuriated the Japanese. They saw this fleet coming in and they were absolutely frustrated that they could not fire back no matter what. Uh, one surprise that did meet the expeditionary group were mines in the harbor. Um, I believe there were about 26 of them. Don't, don't quote me on that. But um, it was the only time that I'm aware of besides Tinian in the Pacific campaign where mines were actually discovered uh, prior to a landing. Uh, they quickly cleared these mines out of the way. And uh, the U.S. Navy had a very smooth entrance into Eniwetok, and they started to shell the island of Engebi even further. Um, this island had already been bombed with about 130 bombs a day, and they did not have any sophisticated bunkers of any kind. So you can imagine what the Japanese are going through. And uh, right before the assault, the U.S. Marines and Army and Navy... They were printing out assault maps very much like this. This one belonged to John B. O'Neill uh, of the U.S. Navy. He was uh, Holland M. Smith's personal surgeon and uh, doctor. So he actually had this for the Enoe Talk assault. But you can actually see the island of Engebi here, which is codenamed Fragile Island. Uh, the island of Enoe Talk here, uh, codenamed Privilege Island. And I don't know if you can see it over... Let's see here. Uh, you can see Perry Island, which is codenamed Heartstrings. They actually had a spell spelling error in the map, but they gave uh, all the officers these maps and said, this is what you're expected to face going on to Anawetok. And given the little intelligence information, they had practically no major defenses labeled out. They were going in largely blind into this thing. So uh, they figured the numerical superiority of the United States was going to just overrun this atoll by and large if it was going to go anything like Kwajalein was going to go. Um, but the first phase of this was to land on Ngebi's flanks. There were two little islands that the U.S. Marines wanted to land artillery on, and that's exactly what they did around one o'clock in the afternoon. And they shelled Ngebi into the night like a fortress. And uh, couple that with naval gunfire, it's really, it's really baffling to me that anything would survive that talk about how they survived these bombardments of Iwo Jima and Okinawa and, and uh, Saipan. Uh, the Japanese were able to survive this, this three phase bombardment of Engebi. It's really mind boggling how they even had anybody to survive to fight back in the first the power place. of the individual foxhole in a sense, isn't it? You know, people were saying earlier in a sidebar about some of these islands with the rock and things and coral that, you know, you dig yourself in a single hole that, Unless you get that direct hit, um, I guess I guess they survived. Yeah. And, you know, some of the diaries that were recovered, some of them would say that some men were buried and some just some of these Japanese just went crazy. Just the, the sheer amount of bombardment that was coming at this island. Um, but uh, the Japanese were going to fight anyway. There was nothing that was going to dissuade them from dying an honorable death for the emperor. Um, according to them. So on the morning of February 18th, 1944, Engebi was the first place to be assaulted. Uh, the 22nd Marine Regiment landed on uh, codename uh, Blue 3 and White 1. 
Uh, the second battalion of the 22nd Marine Regiment was going to land on blue three. And the first battalion was going to land on white one. So these landing beaches uh, were given their code names and they moved into shore after being up for actually they were woken up at about three or four o'clock in the morning, given that last that last famous meal of steak and eggs and the U.S. Navy bombarded and Gebby again. <laughs> if it already wasn't enough, uh, they didn't want to take any chances and they sent them ashore at 0845. And unexpectedly, there there was actually resistance. They were thinking nothing could survive this. Um, but mortars started coming in and dropping on the beaches. Uh, Japanese snipers were still, sur they survived and were still on the beach. And they were still in their holes. They had survived this massive bombardment. And, uh, but overall, the bombardment was extremely effective. It had knocked out more than 50% of the Japanese garrison on Engebi. Uh, the resistance was very, very light even compared to Roy Namor in uh, the Kwajalein Atoll, uh, you're going to see less, less resistance on the beach. But the problem was that since these Japanese were in the holes, they had covered themselves with uh, tin roofing, palm fronds, whatever they could find. They covered themselves with it. And all they had to do is pull this tin sheet, pop the rifle, shoot it, and then duck back down. You wouldn't even know where the shot came from. And this was like this all over the island. So what they realized they had to do is they had to they had to find each individual Japanese survivor from this bombardment and take them out one by one all the way across the island. And it made it a very tedious process. And uh, just to kind of divert your attention to this picture, um, you and I, Paul, had talked about photographs. Um from the Pacific War, and that a lot of people will recognize this, these photographs from Anahuay Talk, but they won't know uh, where they were taken. So yeah. this one is actually very famous. Um, this is actually one of the first photographs taken in landings on Engebi Island. It shows a uh, U.S. Marine was actually shot and killed coming ashore. Now his face actually looks distorted. Uh, this was not by accident. The U.S. Naval sensor actually messed up his face a little bit on purpose so the family at home would not recognize the photograph. Right. Okay. Um, but he's one of the very few casualties that are going to be taken in the landings on Nangebi. Um, one thing that also plagued the Marines going ashore were the, uh, were the spider hole systems. There were actually entire systems developed using gasoline oil drums. The Japanese popped out these oil drum cans through the top and the bottom and they would do these wagon wheels all the way around the island. And so a Japanese soldier could pop out at one end and then go and crawl underground through these oil drum vents and pop out somewhere else. So they started dropping smoke grenades into one of the apertures of these oil drum defense systems. And the smoke would reveal the entire uh, oil drum defense system. And they would drop TNT and uh, the flamethrowers, once they got ashore, really made this a quick battle. Yeah. Um, the flamethrower was, it, it was a brutal weapon, no doubt about it. Uh, the Marines saw that at Tarawa, and it was going to be used for the rest of the war because it was, it, it, I think, for practical purposes of securing an island, it was necessary. Um, the Japanese would not come out of their defense systems, and this seemed to be the only way to do it. Um, well, that, that, that fire element seems to overcome psychologically even the most stubborn enemy. Because I think as human beings, we are so programmed from our DNA going back to our caveman days that fire is a killer. I think even the most well-trained unit, when they're facing a flamethrower tank in, in, in Italy or they're facing individual flamethrowers carried by Marines, it, it's 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 about the worst thing you could face. And I think it, it, though it has people talk about how is it, you know, is it um morally a suitable weapon that's another question but is it the right weapon to dislodge an enemy who don't want to give up then in this situation the answer is yes yeah and there was a marine i read about and uh he was on angebi trying to get japanese out of a hole and uh he said come out we'll take you prisoner and they said in perfect english no we want to die for our emperor and um they they ended up dropping tnt into that hole because of that response alone and um, 
I think since the Marines at that point, the 22nd Marine Regiment, they were green, but they were tough. They uh, they decided, OK, well, we're not going to take prisoners if they're going to be like this. Um, it's just a, one of those matter of facts about the Pacific War. That's just that it's that very ugly element. But it is the truth. And this is how Engevi is one. It's just, you know, shell hole to shell hole action. Um, dodge snipers as you go across, uh, go across this airfield on Engevi and, and move towards the northern part, of, northern part of the island towards Newt Point. That's the very top. I'll show you on this map um, to give you some perspective of what this island looked like here. Um, so you see here, um, you see Blue Beach 3 here on the left and White 1 with the... Uh, the 1st Battalion and the 22nd Battalion, or the uh, 2nd Battalion. 2nd uh, Battalion here swung left towards the airstrip, towards Weasel Point, and then would meet up at Newt Point. Um, they faced lighter resistance. Uh, the 1st Battalion actually had a tougher time going towards the uh, the eastern end of the island over by that, where you can see that palm grove right there. Uh, it seemed to the 1st Battalion that a lot of Japanese sailors from the 61st Guard Force had been stuck there, and they were really putting up a fight between skunk point and that palm, that palm grove there. And they had kind of wedged themselves into this pocket. And uh, it, it took several hours to whittle down this pocket of uh, not even, not even probably 150 Japanese. And uh, it eventually got so hopeless for them as first battalion started to envelop them from the North uh, out of the palm grove in the South over by skunk point. Uh, the Japanese uh, sailors come out, came out in a bonsai charge. They, they figure that their case was hopeless and um, they committed a full on assault. And in the, uh, in the words of Cord Meyer, Lieutenant Cord Meyer, who was there, he said, we cut them light. We cut them down like overripe, overripe wheat. And they lot and they lied there in the sand, like tired children. Um, it, this was a brutal battle. Um, there was, there was nothing easy about it whatsoever, considering the light casualties. It was still ferocious. Um, mm -hmm. one of the, uh, one of the survivors of the Enoita campaign is this, uh, Japanese Navy cap right here. This is, uh, it's made for, made for being worn in the field, but this was, uh, likely owned by one of the members of the 61st guard force. Um, it's unknown if it was taken in the bonsai charge, but, um, this was one of the parts of the garrison that, uh, that made up the, uh, force of the island. But the, uh, once the bonsai charge had commenced and was over, uh, all organized resistance ended on Engebi and it was taken rather quick and the casualties were rather light compared to, uh, Roy Namora. It was actually half the amount of kill that, at that island. So it was a great great relief to everybody that had planned this. And um, considering the ad hoc nature of forming the expeditionary force, it was good news. Um, mm. But uh, once these strong points were whittled down, the, uh, the problem didn't go away. You know, even though all organized resistance was gone, there were Japanese that were still in these holes and they were waiting for Americans to go by and still, uh, you know, shooting them and then ducking back down and just acted as snipers. They were going to fight to the bitter end. And it was going to be like this for two straight days. Um, if you look at the picture on the top, I know it's it's kind of gruesome, but this is one of the most famous pictures of World War II. Um, this is a typical uh, defense, part of the defense system on Engebi. This was taken on Engebi on D-Day. And a Japanese soldier had popped out to throw a grenade at passing Marines and a flamethrower had been nearby and hit him directly with this flamethrower. Um, but it, these little defense systems, they were small. They had all the supplies that they needed. And uh, it, it was going to be this kind of action for another couple of days. And uh, as you're going to see in the next slide, they were going to come out at night. Given uh, General Nishida's orders, they were going to follow it right to the last letter. And uh, one of the men caught in the middle of this with, was Anthony D'Amato. Uh, he was born in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, he'd actually been cited for heroism during the uh, North Africa campaign and Operation Torch at, uh, at Algeria. And he was one of the shipboard Marines who, uh, who helped secure the harbor there. Um, he, uh, he had bad teeth, so it, it almost denied him an entrance into the, into the service. 
Uh, he joined the Marine Corps. His brother joined the Army Air Corps. And he actually found out his brother was killed before the any we talk assault, from what I understand. And on the night of February 19th to the 20th, 1944, before his unit was set to leave uh, the island for good, uh, he was sitting there with two of his foxhole buddies, and the Japanese had been harassing the Marines in these shell holes continuously, nonstop. And uh, so a Japanese soldier came out in the middle of the night, primed a grenade, and threw it in the shell hole. And all three of them were looking for this grenade. And he was the one that found the grenade and he said, get out. And his two buddies leapt out of the hole and he muffled the explosion with his body. And he sacrificed his life, winning the Congressional Medal of Honor and the only one for the Battle of Anahuitak. He gave his life um, for his friends that night. And uh, he, uh, President Roosevelt said it plainly. He said he, 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 uh, he stands among heroes. That's what he, that's what he mentioned it as. But um you know, he's just one example of the sacrifices that were going on during the Battle of Anahuitak. But uh, Engebi was no easy step, but there were still two more islands to go. And uh, Anahuitak Island was next. So this is now the U.S. Army's turn. So they invaded on uh, February 19th, 1944 on Anahuitak Island on Yellow Beach 2 and 3. When they landed, uh, it was dead quiet. A couple bullets whizzed over their heads, uh, some scattered BAR and M1 rifle fire up ahead, but no Japanese. It was like they weren't there. And um, one of the one of the soldiers that walked by, one of the correspondents, he said, this is the easy one, the easiest one yet. And they were thinking it might be like Kiska and the Aleutians. No Japanese. Mm-hmm. So uh, originally it started out very easy. And these green soldiers, the 106th Infantry Regiment, began to get piled up on the beach. And uh, logistics became a really big problem because people weren't moving inland until somebody started barking orders saying, hey, get ashore, go move in. You you shouldn't be sitting on the beach. Uh, The Japanese are that way. And so it's not until that time they actually start running into the Japanese garrison there. And uh, the Japanese on that island decided not to defend at the beach. They decided to do what the Japanese on Atu had done. They waited for the Americans to come to them and not shoot at passing planes. So when they found the Japanese, uh, the 106 were completely surprised. It seemed like they were all over. They also realized they were underground and in the trees. The Japanese were tying themselves to the trees to snipe, and they were in this mangrove, these underground mangroves, and shooting from underground. And so with the ground covered in palm fronds they were frantically trying to throw grenades into every palm frond pile they could find to find where the sniper shot came from and uh that's how the battle of Enuitak island begins and the japanese don't really put up a huge response but um the japanese eventually do when they see that the americans begin to push inland uh this is Anahuitak Island and the Anahuitak Atoll. Uh, you can see here, uh, close under the Marine Corps insignia, the 1st and uh, the 1st uh, Battalion here, if I'm looking correctly. Yep, 1st and 3rd Battalions, uh, red or uh, yellow 1 and yellow 2, where they landed. And uh, the idea was to have one battalion go north and one battalion go south and just capture it in a day. And that was that was what the plan was. Uh, it was figured not many Japanese were going to be on this one. And that was the reason why the bombardment was so light. Uh, it was only it was only a couple cruisers and destroyers to bombard it. And they had a very short bombardment because uh, the Japanese had made very little activity known for air reconnaissance cameras. So they did not prepare for a big fight on this. Right. But uh, the Japanese eventually came out with 400 men and they charged right at the army lines. So this is where things really start to get out of hand. Um, they counterattacked on the right flank with 400 Japanese out of the 900 to 1,000 men garrison, and they almost caused a full-on skedaddle, a full-on retreat for the U.S. Army. And uh, a couple, a couple of heroic U.S. Army soldiers stopped it. Uh, one of the men I mentioned in my book is named Artie Klein. He helped stop this this fiasco retreat back to the beach. He held his carbine over his head and said, I will shoot the first person that runs back. And you're supposed to be all Americans, so act like it. 
And uh, so the assault was beaten off and they kill all 400 Japanese in this assault. And within the first hour and a half of the landing on Anawitak Island, practically little under half of the whole garrison is already destroyed. It's our, the battle's pretty much already over. So uh, it's at this point that it's realized that the U.S. Marines are going to have to be called in to assist the U.S. Army to get this thing done. Um, so the, the 22nd Marine Regiment comes in. The 3rd Battalion had just came from Engebi, and now they were fighting for the second time on Anawitak Island. So this is their second assault in practically as many days. Crazy. So they were already getting tired. Um, so it was really just shoot at every palm tree you could find and shoot at the ground wherever the Japanese poked their rifles at. Um, the Japanese that they encountered were, of course, as I said, not very well trained. There was one story I remember a rifle was poking out from this Japanese soldier and this U.S. Army soldier came up to him, pulled the rifle out of his hands, threw it, shot him, and kept walking. And that's how this fighting was going to go. It was just, let's keep moving, let's conquer it so we can get it done. And uh, the 22nd Marines moved along with the 106 as they started to move towards the last pockets of resistance to the south, um, towards the head of Anahuitoc Island, the biggest bulk of the island. Um, Nighttime brought a really big problem. The U.S. Army was given orders to keep advancing until they found the coast. And the U.S. Marines were taught not to get out of their holes at night, so they stayed put. Uh, the U.S. Army kept going, and they came back to the lines, and then they withdrew. And they didn't. there was a misguided set of orders, and this is where the, the debate between the services begins. Um, the misguided bit of orders causes the entire Marine flank to be open, and the Japanese take advantage of it. So they charge full on in to the Marine lines and kill about eight Marines. And uh, when this happens, this is where the Marine Corps and the army start to really not get along here because they right. have to fight together. And this is just one of those things that's going to build up up until Saipan. And it's going to result into what historians now know as the Buckner board of how Ralph Smith will eventually be relieved of his command. Um, as we'll find out in the Marianas campaign. But organized resistance on Anahuitoc Island ends after some of these feudal charges and uh, just taking out scattered resistance along the way. Uh, this is the first time flares are used at night in the Pacific Theater during World War II. And it came to great fruition. The Japanese were very hesitant to move under their flares. But um, Anahuitoc was a very quick battle. And once it was secured, the Marines pulled out from the 3rd Battalion, joined up with the 1st and 2nd Battalions, and they prepared to land again on the and next... It's just worth, worth pointing out that the, historic, the amateur historian, the professional historian, shouldn't necessarily measure a campaign by the swiftness of it. In that, mm -hmm. sure, some campaigns, Guadalcanal, for example, which goes on weeks and weeks, and this one is, is almost measured in hours, but... An, an intensive few hours can be a very, very different measuring stick than a, than a, than a not, I'm not saying Guadalcanal was drawn out, but use, using time to measure an, a, a, a campaign only gives you part of the story is the point I'm making. Right, exactly. And, it, you know, it, it's just the desperation that set in for the Japanese uh, made this just a ferocious fight. It was not a long fight, but it was ferocious nonetheless. Um, they, it, they just live by that doctrine of no surrender, uh, no matter how hopeless the situation was, um, no matter the tactical advantage or disadvantage, they were going to, they were going to defend the Island to the death. And uh, I, I just think that's what the, made the Pacific so bloody. And, and we talk was certainly no exception. Actually it's recorded that one of the only female Japanese soldiers was captured here at NOE talk. Mm. And it made it to the newspapers and everything. She she was captured with a rifle, a helmet, and everything. Um, where she came from, how she got there, it's not known. But she was confirmed wow. in Hawaii to be the first female Japanese soldier captured in the Pacific Theater. Wow. And, it's, and also, just, you know, we're talking about it on this channel all the time, that, you know, from 42, 43, 44, 45, this is when the U.S. military and the, 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 the other allies is 
everything's getting better. Aircraft recovery, signals, communication, intelligence, carriers, more carriers being produced week in, week out. A aircraft are getting better. And yet the experiences of the guys on the ground more or less hasn't changed and really won't change. You know, the, the experience of a guy first wave on Guadalcanal is pretty much going to be the same as the as a guy first wave in Okinawa, which we're talking all about, you know, three years apart, effectively. So there's this arc of, of improvement at a, at a kind of a technological le level. But for guys involved in first wave assault, wave assaults, it's the same old shit. Doesn't matter which war year of the war you're in. Exactly. And, you know, when you when you saw these testimonies from the veterans that were in a talk and they went to Guam and they went to Okinawa, they went to Saipan. And when you ask when they were asked, what was your toughest battle out of all that? Some of them said any we talk. It's like, really? Not Okinawa or Guam? Those were bigger battles. No, NOE talk, because that was the first. That was my first time in combat. So it that was a really big surprise for me. But, you know, combat just never seems to change. And it did prepare both of these very green units for bigger, bloodier battles later. Um, but it definitely, it definitely was a great preview for the big stuff that would happen, the Marianas and the Ryukyus uh, later on in the Pacific. Yeah. But uh, Perry Island, this is going to be the last stage of the NOE talk assault. This is the home of General Nishida's headquarters. Um, it's really it's really interesting to note that uh, you you would think that they would fight their bitterest fight here. But after what happened on two islands in the NOE talk atoll, we bombarded this heavier than any of the other islands. Uh, the Japanese on this stood absolutely no chance. So when the Marines were starting towards shore, they were tired. Uh, logistics were actually starting to run out. They were actually stripping the ammunition from ships off of shore to continue the assault. That's how that's how low on fumes that the assault was running on by this point. Uh, little tidbit of information: Lee Marvin would actually land on Perry Island and experience his first uh, some of his first combat here. He was on. Uh, Kwajalein, and then he served here at Perry Island and almost got killed here before he went to Saipan. But uh, Perry Island, codenamed Heartstrings, uh, met heavy resistance on the beach. Uh, U.S. naval gunfire actually hit some of the Marines on the beach by accident. There was a little bit of friendly fire going on. They actually hit some of the, ship, the, some of the rocket ships offshore. They killed uh, several Marines on there, too. Uh, this is part of that learning phase. Uh, we got to learn how to control our friendly fire better. We should not be having this happen this late in the war. Um, but Perry Island is the last is the last straw for the Japanese. General Nishida is killed sometime during this battle. We really don't know how or when. Um, if he committed suicide, he was he was never found. Um, the grenades arched from inland towards the beach, but the Marines didn't stop. They kept going. And they found that a lot of the Japanese had actually committed suicide in their bunkers. They had pulled the uh, shoes off the, uh, their feet and put the toes in the trigger guard, the barrel of their heads and blew their heads off or strapped mines to their bodies and blew themselves to pieces. So they knew that watching two islands assaulted, they knew they were next and it was done. It was a done deal. And uh, after one day of quick combat, the battle of Perry Island was over and one of our last artifacts that we'll see here, this Marine canteen was actually found on the battlefield, is actually still named uh, to this person. Uh, we actually know that this U.S. Marine made all three assaults with the 3rd Battalion of the 22nd Marine Regiment. So um, people say if, uh, you know, if artifacts could talk, we'd learn a lot. Um, I yeah. would say in some respects, take I it a bit anyway. further. Um, I'm sure that they wouldn't talk. They would scream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, Perry Island was a very quick success. Um, very few casualties were taken on the United States. Um, but this was uh, this was this was not the end for the 22nd Marines. Uh, the army was done practically. They came ashore on Perry Island, just mop up a little bit, but they found hardly any Japanese left. Um, but the battle's cost overall: 313 Americans are killed, with 879 wounded. Uh, the Japanese lose practically the entire garrison with 177 captured. One story I read about why they were so fanatic is what they were, what the Japanese were told. Um, one prisoner came aboard ship and said, you may have taken NOE talk, but you will never reconquer 
Montana or California. And I just thought that was the most interesting thing ever that mm. the Japanese here thought that they were winning the war. They had no idea what was really going on, except maybe their commanders knew, but they were confident of victory. They thought they were going to maybe win until the very end, until the uh, truth was abundantly clear. Uh, the Japanese, from what I understand, are still there on NOE Talk Atoll today. Uh, there was a there was a plan to go recover the dead from the Atoll, but um, I think uh, COVID kind of changed that. Uh, they went to Kwajalein and recovered a lot of the dead, but the Japanese, from what I understand, are still there today. Uh, Operation Flintlock Jr. was next. Talk about more invasions, as if this wasn't enough. Uh, the 22nd Marines were called again to assault. Between March and April of 1944, they assaulted more than seven atolls in all the islands accompanying them. Just this is this is an idea of how many small islands they took around the Anawitak Atoll to secure flanks and make sure there were no remaining Japanese in the area. Namu, Alinglaplap, Namarik, Eben, Kili, Bikini, Alingane, Rongari, Biktar, Atikarik, Taka, Iluk, Lukiep, Jimo, Majit, Eben, Lib. It just, they would take a battalion of Marines and keep landing for a consistent month. And one of the men that's going to make this assault is this guy right here. Um, his name is uh, Theodore Miller, and he was with the 22nd Marine Regiment at Anawitak and Perry. And this is him after two and a half days on Engebi Island. Very famous picture. Yeah, uh, that's actually, it. That's that's covers of books. That's 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 everywhere. That one, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And he is tragically killed at Evan Atoll on March 19th, 1944. One of only two Marines killed during the assault. He gets off the ramp and there are about 20 Japanese, including civilians, shooting back at the battalion of Marines coming ashore to Evan. And he is one of the two that is shot and killed. The other is John C. Nelson. And uh, he is now currently uh, resting in the punch bowl in Hawaii. Right. But uh, Flintlock Jr. is that small part of the Pacific camping you never hear about. Um, but it was absolutely necessary. And I also found it funny that every time we took an atoll, we took a picture of us raising the American flag and telling the natives that the Japanese are no longer in control of the marshals. We are. And this is... Uh, this is how we're going to be operating things. And this is actually a picture of it, of it happening on one of the atolls. Um, so why is any we talk important in retrospect? It's the last of the major atolls to be assaulted in a full battle. Um, after this, it's going to be core. It's going to be large mountainous coral islands. Yeah. Uh, Colin M. Smith said we're through with pulverizing atolls. Now we have to go up against mountainous islands where the Japanese can dig in. And I said that right before the landings on Saipan, but it cut off Truk and served as an air base and a harbor for the Marianas campaign. It was incredibly significant. It was that linchpin that closed the Marshall Islands campaign for yeah. good. And it was just their experience as well. Is that you? You know, you said earlier about the they may not have been trained for the terrain that they're going to be facing, and that would apply in some ways to the, the Pacific campaign generally, but. If you've got your small unit tactics mastered, if you know how to do that basic fire maneuver, that will kind of get you through despite of the, the, the terrain you're encountering, sort of. I mean, people say, no, no, you need to know as well. But, I mean, it's all a great bonus, having intelligence. And, and of course, the Allied intelligence got better and better as the war went on. But if you're good at just basic infantry tactics, you can get out of a hell of a lot of trouble with that. With that. And the more you do these taking of islands the more you're going to get better and better of course you have to phase in the replacements and the and the the, the, the new people in there but you've got that core knowledge at, at, uh, in existence absolutely and that's why the united states got better and better at uh, landing on these islands at, like iwo jima you couldn't have had an iwo jima without a tarawa quadrillion and an yeah. it just would not yeah. have worked yeah no definitely um, and people have been saying in the sidebar all along, isn't that about the atomic bomb, the nuclear? So we'll 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 get that that story out as well. Yeah. So um, that's really where a lot of people know about Anawitak. And when I speak um, just around the area, people uh, people come up to me and say, "Oh yeah, I was at the Anawitak testing, you know, or the cleanup." Uh, Anawitak is going to serve as this Cold War testing ground. And the justification for this was that it is so isolated that no one could possibly miss this place. 
So, um, you know, what, what's the big deal? Um, there's not a whole lot of natives there. So, um, you know, what's, what's the big difference if we just blow it up? And it's used over 60 times with atomic weapons. Um, I was not familiar with the effects of real atomic weaponry until I started researching this book. Um, there were accidents. There were pilots who flew through these mushroom clouds. And when they would go to sleep that night, their fingernails and toenails would glow green and have their faces would be stuck and melted to the pillows. This was some serious stuff. Yeah. And uh, and we talked was the epicenter along with Bikini Atoll in uh, in going to this Cold War the United States found itself in. And uh, Anna Weetok is radioactive to this day. There was a cleanup effort after uh, after all this was done in the 40s, 50s. And uh, the people that were sent there in the U.S. Army were not told the risks. They were not told, OK, you know, you have to worry about Hodgkin's lymphoma or anything. Just go clean it up. Uh, they were in the hot coral dust, breathing it all in and their construction equipment. And they took all the radioactive sediment and sand and they put it in what's known as runnit dome or cactus dome. And uh, the scary thing is that it's it does have fracture and cracks. It's still there and it's leaking into the Pacific, Pacific Ocean even today. Uh, there is an assurance that it will be fine for another 20 or so years. But if a typhoon hits it, that's the, that's the main concern by the Department of Energy is that uh, this thing could break open into the Pacific Ocean and be a real ecological disaster. So um, and we talk is more covered for this role than the battle itself, uh, which is it, it's crazy. And I think that's the reason why we have to tell the history of the battle, too. Yeah. Um, John C. Nelson, the guy who hung Nuremberg defendants. He actually was accidentally electrocuted at NOE talk working there and he died. So um, there's, there's a lot of history behind this atoll. Well, it has been an absolute masterclass of presentation. People absolutely loved it. I'll hold up my copy of the book as well, because Ryan kindly sent me one. A couple of people have already said they've ordered it. That's great. If the rest of you watching can also go out there and order it, it, it makes some, some Ryan's efforts to bring us this history uh, worthwhile. Um, but you've got more information about your exhibit and your collection, because people have been asking about you know, 10,000 artifacts and how do you get them and where can they see them? So um, tell us about this, um, this, this upcoming um, exhibition. Yes. So um, I, what I do is with Patriot Preservation, I will loan artifacts to various museums, ba you know, if they want a World War II exhibit. Um, our first large one will be at the Museum of Arts and Sciences in Daytona Beach, Florida, between October 14th and the 21st. Um, it will cover Europe, the Pacific and the home front. And it, it is a project that I have loved from the very beginning. It's been a year in the making, uh, a dream for 10 years. And uh, it, there's going to be first of the line artifacts there telling you how World War II really was. And uh, it's going to be an amazing experience. I can't wait to see it open. And uh, I'll be posting some of it on my Facebook page with the company. Brilliant. And we had one final question. I mean, people, you've been asking people's questions as you go along there. But who, who controls the atoll to this day? Uh, so actually, they renamed they renamed the island itself. It's uh it's now called Anahuatac. So they changed it to the original name. But um, I, that's actually a very good question of who owns. I think it's part of the Republic of Micronesia, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. I think that might need to be fact checked. But, um, you know, they're, they're largely independent. So I think roughly about 200 people live there today. Yeah, it's not, but, it's uh, not a massive population, is it? So um, No, yeah. no, not well, at all. Well, it's been an absolute masterclass um, and where people are saying invite him back to just talk about your artifacts, which we can do that at some point in the future. Um, but uh, given that we've got another show starting in 35 minutes, folks, uh, it gives everyone time to go and have a cup of tea or coffee or something stronger, depending on where you are in the world. But Ryan, it's been I'm glad we got there in the end. We had it scheduled and postponed and uh, it, it's a fantastic. You know, you, you, you were good. and You were on talking about the photos, but honestly, with every first, you know, first time guest in terms of a major presentation was on your level, I wouldn't have anything to worry about forever because you're, you're absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for having me on. Brilliant. So, folks, you heard it there. I'll see you in 35 minutes' time. Ryan, I'll invite back in the future, but in 35 minutes' time, off to Salerno and the first Armour Division. So see you all there, everybody. Cheers. Thanks for watching. Bye.